Scripture reading for this morning is found in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. If you would turn there a while, 1 Corinthians, chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. If you're using a pew Bible, it can be found on page 1,131. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. The word of the Lord says this, Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unifies himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we approach you this morning, I pray that we would do so with open hearts, open minds, and open souls. I pray that your spirit would be heavy upon us. And I pray that the truth of your word would permeate everything that is said and done in this service today. I pray that you would be honored and glorified, that you would be raised up above all of our earthly and worldly concerns. And that's a, it's quite an audacious prayer to pray. But God, we simply want to be about you, about your business, about your word, about your truth, and about your love. So work in us to that end this morning. And where your truth is easy for us to digest, I pray that would be the case. And where your truth is hard for us to digest, I pray that your spirit will work within us to mold us and shape us into your image, not the other way around as we so often desire. God, we want to follow where you lead. We don't want to take you where we are. So work in us to that end this morning. Mold us and shape us from the inside out according to the truth of your word that you would be glorified above all in a world that screams the opposite. Be the constant in our lives. Be our Lord and creator. Be the one who knows us intimately and help us to feel and know your love today. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Normally, I would dismiss children at this time, but since this is a fifth Sunday of the month, uh, children will be staying in for the worship service. I know that, it, I, and I say this every fifth Sunday, I know that's inconvenient for some of you guys, um, but we do believe it's important that families learn to worship together. And if your child is a distraction, please do not feel that you are in any way, shape, or form taking away from anything else. Because that's going to happen, and that's okay. Um, if you need to leave for a little bit, go out, get a snack, whatever, that is perfectly fine. Now, I will say... Um, when I laid out this sermon series ahead of time, I did not take into account that this is the fifth Sunday of the month, and I'll be preaching on a subject that's a little different um, than normal, um, although I'm glad it's this Sunday and not next Sunday. So with that being said, for those of you who aren't aware or maybe new with us this morning, I'm doing a five-week sermon series on human sexuality. Today brings us to this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. But before we get started, I want to recap real quickly last Sunday's message. It's going to take about 30 seconds to recap last Sunday's message to make sure that we are all on the same page. Last week, we preached out of Genesis chapter 2, verses 20 through 25. God's design for mankind is that sexual expression take place in a marital relationship between one man and one woman. That's the biblical design given to us by God, backed by Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 and 5. Back by Paul, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 31. And I bring that up because I think that's a good reminder for our starting point today of where we will go from here. With that being said, you can obviously see the sermon title is An Inconvenient Truth. Now, I don't know if you know, I, I actually stole this sermon title. I'm sure you probably, well, not sermon title, I stole the title of the sermon. Off of a 2006 documentary that was put out. It was the 11th highest grossing documentary movie of all time. It earned two Academy Awards. 
And the star of the movie was one of our former vice presidents, a guy that goes by the name of Al Gore. And in this documentary, which I have admittedly never watched, okay, so I'm just throwing that out there, it was a documentary about global warming and the dangers of global warming, not just global warming, but man-made global warming. And in the movie, I've watched pieces of it, I've just never watched the whole thing through. In this movie, our former vice president lays out the case that because of man-made global warming, our planet is heating up at a rapid and unexpected pace. Because of that, there's dire consequences. That's the basic premise, that's the basic gist of this documentary. It's powerful, it's hard-hitting, hitting, and it's sobering. But here's the question I want to ask you as we get started today. Is it true? Man, Pastor Scott, you're getting into some murky waters as we get started here, right? Is it true? And we're not going to go over whether global warming or man-made global warming is true today. We're not going to cover that at all, right? We're not going to cover the fact of whether our former vice president's predictions are going to come to fruition during our lifetime or the next in the exact manner that he warned about. Because let's be honest, there's many in our world that would agree with what he said. And then there's some, I would say few, who don't agree. Not everybody agrees on it, though. But the foundational premise of this movie is based upon a truth that was presented to those watching it. But is it a truth or is it a theory? I'm not a scientist, right? Let me put out this disclaimer right away. In no way, shape, I love watching Big Bang Theory. I'm into science fiction, geeky kind of stuff. But I am far from a scientist. That is not who I am. That is not my heart. And I have not studied up much on global warming or man-made global warming. But here's the one thing I want to know, I know, and want to ask is simply this. Without time, will we ever know if it's a truth or just a theory? You won't. You have to wait for time to pass. Seems to me that it's more of a theory, but I understand that the title, An Inconvenient Theory, doesn't grab your attention and evoke some sort of urgency within you near as much as an inconvenient truth does. Now, with that being said, I, like many of you here today, believe the Bible to be the inspired and authoritative word of God. I believe that this Bible, the one that we have just read out of, is the truth. Within it, Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Does everybody in our world agree with my stance on the Bible? Of course not. Of course not. Why? The answer to that question is actually given in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says this, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Which means that there is an element to knowing God that cannot be proved from a physical point of view that we have to take on faith. I believe the Bible to be truth. I believe it to be the word of God. Not everybody does. Because there's an element of faith to that claim. So even if I would agree with Mr. Gore on the impact of global warming, I would push back against the word truth being used in his title. I find global warming to be incredibly inconvenient. I don't like hot weather. Those of you who know me, I won't complain about it. Right? Because I don't, I, I'm more of a fall winter guy, so when people complain about the coldness, I'm like, suck it up, you get the summer. So I don't like to complain about either way. When I like hot weather the most, this is going to sound really weird to you, it's stupid, is when I'm either exercising in it or laying by the beach. Right? Because when I'm exercising in it, then I know I'm supposed to get hot and sweaty. Not when I'm going for a drive or at a baseball game or something like that. Or if I'm sitting at the beach, I like hot weather then. Unless it's a really warm bath water type of beach, like the last time I was in Florida, it was nasty. Right? But the cool, refreshing beach, then I like it. Why do I bring that up? Because I'm sidetracked completely. And <laughs> because the reason that it is inconvenient is that I don't like to think about global warming. If I'm being perfectly honest, I don't like to think about the impacts of what Mr. Gore said if it is true. What it means not for myself, more so for my kids and my grandkids and further down the line. 
the impact that it will have in, the, in their life, and it also means that I should probably be changing my lifestyle in the here and now so that the impact is lessened upon future generations. That's inconvenient to me. If it's true, then it's something we should all be addressing. But what about the inconvenient truth that is found in our passage of Scripture today? I don't know if you saw it or not, but it is definitely in there staring us right in the face in verses 18 through 20. This simply says this, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but he who sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. The inconvenient truth, I would argue, in this passage is found in the second sentence of the set of verses that I just read to you today. It's, it's a truth that says that there is something different about sexual sin in our lives than other sins. Paul tells us that other sins are outside of the body, but he who sins sexually sins against what resides within us. That would be the Holy Spirit. But, but Pastor Scott, a sin is a sin, right? This is where it gets uncomfortable, by the way. A sin is a sin. All sins are equally bad, right? What do you think? Did you read what I just read? Did you hear what is written down there? Are you sure about that statement anymore? Because the level of insistence that Paul uses here leads me to believe that there's something about sexual sin that happens within us on a deeper level than other sins. Again, all other sins, Paul says, a person commits are out the side the body, but he who sins sexually sins against their own body. How can this be? Why is this the case? Verse 15 gives us some pretty good insight into the answer. Verse 15 says this, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. If you have come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ, if you acknowledge him as your Lord and Savior, if you have given him control of your life, then you are found to be in Christ. It's the crux of John 3.16, right? Right? That God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal or everlasting life. And if that's the case, scripture tells us that he who has faith and believes in Christ, now has Christ, or the Holy Spirit of Jesus, residing within him. John 14, 23, Jesus says this, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, we will come to him, and make our home with him. Do you listen to the wording Jesus used there? Not I. Listen to it. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. There's something more at work. When you have the Holy Spirit of God living in you, you have the Holy Spirit of God the Father and Christ the Son, as well as the God's Word speaking within you. It's not just separate, it's everything. 1 Thessalonians 3, 4, verses 3 and 5 says this, It's God's will that you should be sanctified, you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lusts like the heathen who do not know God. Right? And, and I always hesitate when I read uh, Bible verses or do stuff with big Christianese type words. Right? And the main word in this passage from 1 Thessalonians, sanctification. I know that sounds big and confusing. Sanctification is simply this, the process of growing closer to God. When you go closer to God, you will become made more holy into his image. That's what sanctification means, growing closer to God, becoming purified by God and his Holy Spirit alive and at work within you. And according to God's word, sexual immorality will not only stunt this process, but it will stop it on the spot. I can't grow closer to God while I'm sabotaging my relationship with God. Right? Think about it this way. There's a lot of Olympic sports out there. And we know about the big ones. 
there's a lot of ones that go under the radar that you don't think about. And to be honest with you, some of them I could care less about. I don't give a flying rip about equestrian events in the Olympics. I don't care about fencing. I don't care about Taekwondo, which I didn't even know was an Olympic sport until I looked it up this week on the computer. I don't give a rip about rhythmic gymnastics. Do any of you? And if you do, when was the last time you watched them? But there's some under-the-radar sports that I actually really do enjoy watching. Like, there's some really good ones. I don't know if you ever watched handball. Looks like it'd be really fun to play. I don't know if you ever watched trampoline, because it's psycho. They're literally jumping from about the floor of the sanctuary to the height of the sanctuary and doing three or four flips between each rotation, landing and going for 30 seconds like that. It's absolutely nuts. I love watching archery, because those folks are ridiculous. One of the other events that I really appreciate is rowing. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, rowing can't be that difficult. And if you're thinking that, go and sit on a rowing machine and do a workout and tell me how you feel when you're done. I got really ambitious back when I was in really good shape, and I went to the Y, and they had a rowing machine. I'm like, ah, oh, 10,000 meter. I wonder how long that'll take me to do. So I did a 10,000 meter rowing workout. The answer is anywhere between 45 and 50 minutes on average. After I was done with that workout, every time, there was literally not a dry bone on my body. Everything was sopping wet, including my sweatshirt, like soaked through the sweatshirt. And I would have to sit on the seat for about 30 seconds before I even thought about standing up. And then when you stood up, I had to stand for about 15 seconds until my quads and hammies and glutes engaged to the point where I felt comfortable actually stepping over without falling flat on my face. It is an incredibly hard workout. And when you look into rowing, like the single rowing is kind of cool. Where I really get a kick out of it is when they do the eight-man teams. The boats that they are in are over the length of a volleyball court long. The eight-man teams. It's 65-foot long boats. Eight people, two oars, all of them rowing in perfect unison. And they can accomplish some amazing things together. The world record for the 2,000-meter eight-man row was set by the 2004 United States Olympic team. They wrote it in 5 minutes and 19 seconds. And what's fascinating, I learned this this week too, teams actually row faster in the semifinal than they do the finals. Because until they get to the finals of the same day, they're gassed from the semifinals. So that team won the gold medal by finishing 30 seconds slower than their semifinal time. Right? And it's fascinating. And when you, when you, when you, go, when you realize that, 18, 5 minutes, 19 seconds, over 2,000 meters, they're paddling the entire trip at 18 miles an hour. It's impressive, and when you watch it, it's even more impressive because everything is perfectly in sync. What if one person decided not to row? What if one person decided, you know what, I'm going to row, but I'm going to do my own thing. You guys go when you want, I'm going to go when I want. Or what if one person said, you know what, I just don't feel like getting my oars out of the water today. I'm just going to leave them hang there. How would that team do? Pretty rough, right? I mean, they would go, I don't care how good they are, if they're the best in the world, they would not even qualify for the Olympics at that level. Why? Because all the paddles have to be rowing in the same direction. And if even one is not doing their job, the entire team feels the effects of it. It would make a huge difference. Guys, it's the same way in our faith. You can't grow closer to God while keeping part of yourselves separated or separate from God. And Paul would say that when you do that in the area of sexual immorality, it's even more magnified. So if that's the case, I think we need to define what sexual sin looks like or what it is. According to God's word, as I mentioned at the beginning of the message today, to kind of set the table... Sexual immorality is the physical fulfillment of sexual desires outside the bonds of a marriage relationship. One man, one woman. Anything outside of that is what Paul and Christ and Moses and the Bible in general would say is sexual immorality. But not just that. Jesus then takes it a step further in Matthew chapter 5, verse 28. I'm telling you, it gets more and more inconvenient. He says, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So it's not just the physical manifestation of a sexual relationship outside of marriage, but it's the internal condition of lust within our hearts 
that affects it or is defined as sexual immorality as well. You've heard the phrase, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? You could argue that a good portion of that road is built on the foundation of lustful desires. 1 John 2.16 says, Everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. James writes, Each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. And this is exactly why lust is such a damaging issue in our world. So I was curious about this. What are Americans' attitudes in this area? So I did a little research. Came across a website. It's a recovery website. Non-Christian based. Recovery Village of, did a study that was put out of September 13th last year, 2022. Here's what they found. Around 35% of all internet downloads are pornographic. 40 million United States adults regularly visit integrate internet pornography websites. 10% of United States adults admit to having an addiction to internet pornography. And 17% of all women struggle with porn addiction. And I threw that in to make you realize that this is not just a male issue, it is a societal issue. Some conditions that frequently co-occur with a pornographic addiction include the following. Depression, anxiety, social anxiety, mood disorders, sexual addictions, substance use disorders, and memory problems, amongst many more. So let me say, once again, these are not taken from a Christian organization. But researchers that are simply seeking honest answers. And while they are faith issues, they're also societal issues. But the findings of society seem to support what Paul is telling us in Scripture, don't they? That sexual immorality is not just any other sin, but it affects us in a way that others don't. There's something different about it. Look, we can see, according to Scripture, that sexual sin is associated time and again with leading to some sort of punishment after death or what we would call hell. Boy, that got real in a hurry, didn't it? Whenever destructive behaviors or patterns that lead to hell are mentioned in the Bible, listen to what accompanies them. Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Galatians 5, 19 and 20. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. What's the first one? Sexual immorality. Impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, faction, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Revelation 21.8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those practicing magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. That's tough. But the second point I want to make this is this. Sexual immorality has absolutely no place in God's design for his people who are in right relationship with him. And certainly no place in anyone who wants to live life to the fullest in a way that God designed and ordained. Ephesians 5.3 says, Among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. Impurity, greed, because these are improper for God's people. Colossians 3, 5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. 1 Peter 2, 11, dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. And Paul tells us very plainly in verse 13 today, food for the stomach and stomach for food. But God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexuality, sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Now, guys, I'm going to go off the rail a little bit here. I'm going to speculate. And here's what I mean. It seems to me that if I were Satan and I wanted to draw people away from God, to create a barrier, to create a chasm between God and his creation. Especially many people. 
sexual immorality would be a pretty good way to accomplish this task. I mean, if you look at our text in 1 Corinthians verses 18 through 20, if I'm Satan, the first thing I would do is I would attempt to minimize verses 18 through 20. I don't want people thinking about them, reading about them, talking about them, or understanding them. I want people to think that it is just another la di da thing. That sexual immorality is no big deal. Because when I get people to realize that, then I'm effectively minimizing the dangers of it. They won't take it seriously. They won't look into it. They won't fear it at all. I read another study this week. It was a 2016 study from Barna. And the title of the study was What Americans Believe About Sex. Here's what they concluded. The greatest divides are what you'd expect them to be between people of faith, especially Christians, and the broader population, and between younger and older generations. Whereas practicing Christians are still, oving, still overwhelmingly tie sex to marriage, the move among the greater U.S. population, most evidently among younger generations, is a delinking of marriage and sex. Sex has become less a function of procreation or an expression of intimacy and more about having a personal experience. To have sex is increasingly seen as pleasurable and important element in the journey towards self-fulfillment. Not... God fulfillment. And I'll be perfectly honest. I do not understand all the rules. I'm not up to date on all the lingo or everything that goes along with it. So take that worth a grain of salt. Right? When it comes to sexual expression in our country and in our nation, I'm not up to date. Some of it, though, some of what is happening in our world is very good. Here's what I mean by this. Women are speaking up in a way that they never have before. Women who have experienced abuse in their lives are coming forward. And there's power to protect them. And women should be protected from that. Men should be protected but too. But let's be honest, it's not the same experience for men as it is for women globally. But let me give you an example about where it gets confusing to me. Because a couple years ago, there was a famous woman who came out about the sexual abuse that she had experienced growing up as a child. She actually confronted the person who did it to her. And it was incredibly powerful incredibly powerful, and I'm glad for her speaking up. I'm glad for her voice. I'm glad for what she did. I cannot imagine the courage or strength it would have taken her to do that. So I'm impressed by that and glad that she did it. Here's what I don't understand. Shortly after she did that, in an attempt to demonstrate her freedom from this man and the damage that he did to her life, she did so by posing nude for a magazine photo shoot. Her reasoning was this. This is an article written about it. She says, I hope that we can one day get to a point where everyone realizes that women do not have to be modest to be respected. We are free to draw confidence and happiness in our own way, and it is never for someone else to choose for us or even judge us for matter. That, for that matter. That sounds good and empowering, doesn't it? But what I don't understand is coping with an issue of sexual abuse that happened in the history of your life by objectifying yourself in a sexual manner. I, I personally, I just don't get it. It doesn't make any sense to me. It seems to be counterproductive to the results that you are trying to achieve. And it doesn't beat with the heart of God or the word of God that I see. When it says specifically in our passage today that we do, are to flee sexual immorality. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes from the world, not from the Father. That's the sentiment that's echoed throughout the Bible. We started it in Genesis chapter 2 last week. That's the second chapter of the Bible. God created man, and then he created man and woman and said it's good for them to be together. That's the standard God said at the beginning. What if we flip all the way to the end of the Bible, we get to Revelation chapter 22, verses 14 and 15, say this. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside of those gates are the dogs. Those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Guys, that is only eight verses from the end of Revelation, which is the end of Bible. This concept of marriage being between one man and one woman 
fleshes itself out through the entire pages of this book and stays consistent in that manner. So what do I want you to take away from today? If you get nothing out of this message, nothing else out of this message, I want you to understand the inherent danger in minimalizing sexual immorality according to the word of God and its repercussions on eternity. Don't look away. Don't act as if it doesn't exist. Jude chapter 1 verse 7 says this, In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example for those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. It is not comfortable. It is not easily digestible. This is not a feel-good message. But I believe that it is the truth. And because of that, it should be handled accordingly. Now, I'm going to close the message today with an object lesson, a visual representation, something I don't do too often, but I thought it was interesting. This, you've probably seen hanging on the walls of my office before. This represents a really cool day in my life. Now, for those of you who know me, know that I enjoy hunting. Full disclosure, I'm not very good at it. I wish I was, but for the amount of time that I spend in the woods, my harvest time is very low. Those of you who know me also know that I am not a antler hunter. I'm a meat hunter. The red meat that our family eats, by and large, is coming from deer. It's venison meat. So when we hunt, we hunt for food. We don't hunt for bones, because I can't eat these in any way, shape, or form that I want to. Right? So I don't shoot big deer, usually. And maybe to you this isn't a big deer, but to me it is. This is the biggest buck I've ever shot. It represents a very cool morning I spent on the woods, on the mountains, just over there a couple miles. It was opening day. Yeah, you want to know exactly where it is? Sure, we'll go for a walk sometime. (laughs) Opening day, I believe it was 2017. About 8.30, 8.45 in the morning was the time when I shot this guy. Every other hunter I talked to that day said, there's no deer here, we haven't seen any deer. Now, I will fully admit that this guy was the only buck I saw all morning that day. But I also saw 16 doe. I also saw 16 doe. In fact, when I shot this buck, all 16 doe, including the buck, were within about 50 to 60 yards of me in my tree stand. I was sitting about 20 feet up a tree in bright blaze orange, trying my hardest to remain calm while settling the crosshairs on this guy. And I did a terrible job of it. If you want to hear that story, ask me that later, because I actually had to pull the trigger twice. The only reason that I am standing before you with these antlers in my hands today is because the deer that they formerly belonged to was so concerned with what was going on around him and so obsessed with what his body was telling him that he forgot to look up the tree and see the inherent danger that was literally right beside him. That's why I have these antlers. Scripture tells us that that danger is equally present in our lives as well. Do you believe it? Will you live your life accordingly? One more time. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. You don't know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who's in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Paul's words to Corinthians are every bit, if not even more applicable today than they were the day he wrote them. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, may your spirit convict us. May your word work within us. May your truth be alive and active. And God, especially in the inconvenient and uncomfortable times, I pray that your truth would prevail. I pray that our interpretation and my interpretation of this word would be exactly as you desire and deem it to be. And where I fall short, may your spirit intervene on our behalf. God, work within us to mold us and shape us into your image, to turn you into our people, to have us be the kind of church that you would have us be, not who we want to be, 
Not following our own desires or our own leading. Not following the, what the world says is, should feel good and look good. We want to be about your business. We want about your truth. We want about your word. Help us to see people as you see people. Help us to love as you love. Help us to be able to experience the forgiveness that you so desire within us because we have fully surrendered ourselves to you. Work within us to that end. Be Lord of our lives today. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.